Thanks for coming today. Um, I'm Evan McGee. Uh, it's just a little bit like who I am. There we go. Uh, and this is Machine Learning and AI for Asterisk. Um, we're going to be covering a bunch of different topics here and a lot of different projects in the machine learning and AI space. Um, everything from sentiment analysis and speech synth synthesis through um, some natural language understanding, natural language processing. I'm going to be explaining some of the concepts and theories behind it. Uh, I don't expect anyone here to, well, let's do a show of hands. Who actually has a background at all in like linear algebra or differential equations? Have you studied that kind of stuff? It might have been a while, college or anything like that. Yeah. So it's actually surprisingly accessible, the math that's behind this. I'm not going to dig into it too much, but you're going to see some stuff with vector diagrams and things like that that actually is kind of exciting how things that you learned that might have not been useful until now suddenly are extraordinarily applicable. Uh, but we're going to kind of you know, kind of breeze through that. And I've also got a bunch of containers running on my machine here that actually have demonstrations of most of these things running. So you can actually see in real time, you know, what kind of output you would get and how you might use that in an Asterisk-based installation or, you know, anywhere else you want. How's it going, Evan McGee? Uh, I'm a phone assistant and I sort of assist phones and do things. Um, so what is machine learning? You know, this is a good definition I found. Uh, machine learning is a form of artificial intelligence that provides systems the ability to automatically learn and improve from experience without being explicitly programmed. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. What we're talking about here is being able to train a computer to solve a problem without being told the actual answer in advance. We don't have to program it. It just kind of understands, based on the input, what the output is roughly expected to be. And this is stuff that we've had for a long time. And by stuff, I mean, you know, algorithms and theories developed in the 80s and 90s are really coming to the forefront now and are exploding due to the availability of cheap compute. The fact that we can just throw GPUs at these things and train models in days and not months allows us to iterate so much faster than was ever possible historically. That's why you're seeing an explosion of this now, is we've really gotten to the point, the tipping point, where we can just do the training and get the output in a reasonable amount of time versus just waiting months and months and months, which is why I was somewhat limited to academia in the past. Uh, here are some major open source projects you might have heard about. Uh, you know, TensorFlow is the big one released by Google. Um, that is primarily a neural network based uh, training system. That is the big one that they use to do a lot of their ranking and that kind of stuff. Keras is a Python API that sort of like links a bunch of these together, including uh, TensorFlow and Theano. I'm actually not going to mention Theano or Theano uh, because the contributors, as of about four days ago, are discontinuing it. Um, they have decided that TensorFlow is the way forward. They are not going to continue developing Theano, so uh, I'm not even going to cover it. Uh, Cafe2 is the guys who did Cafe. Cafe is a... Um, machine learning based video and picture uh, library that is supposed to replace like open uh, CL to do uh, you know image analysis and video analysis and cafe 2 is the same guys at Facebook now you're gonna see a lot of these open source guys develop these in academia and then got hired by Facebook or Google and fortunately are still pumping these out and letting us get access to them um, spacey is a Python natural language understanding natural language processing library that we're gonna be actually looking at pretty good torch is one based in Lua so if you love Lua or you're using that somewhere I know free switch uses that quite a lot and other projects use it quite a lot so if you need one torch is pretty great and scikit learn is just a whole series of Python tools uh, they allow you to do a lot of different complex like matrix algebra and uh, scientific computing. You're going to see a lot of these things are, a lot of the uh, inputs, if you didn't know already, are in Python. That's become kind of the lingua franca of machine learning in terms of open source application and APIs. Um, there are bindings and plenty of other things like R or you know, MATLAB. You can get into it a lot of different ways, but Python is really the way to the easiest route in. So I would recommend that. And as a Ruby guy, it makes me sad because I wish it were Ruby, but it's not. Uh, so, applied, right? These th projects are not just theoretical, they're applied right now and businesses making a lot of money. The um, Google Translate, right, uses the uh, TensorFlow and that kind of stuff to help run their things through. I'll just, I'll just do it. Perfect. Thanks, my man. Uh, so that's what Translate does. Uh, Google Speech, same sort of thing. Um, IBM Watson, again, this just, I'm sorry, these are just kind of examples, right? These are, if you haven't heard about all these, you can look at them. Poly is a uh, speech generation tool. That's Amazon's uh, artificial speech generation tool. Lex is their chatbot interface. Uh, Wit.ai is intense, like you've set up previous, like um, somebody sends a thing, we'll actually look at this later. Someone sends a request, like I'm looking for a place to eat in Orlando, and you've set up intense that says, oh, 
you know, based on questions like eating and cities and that kind of stuff, the intent is restaurant search. And the application will know, oh, OK, this person's looking for a restaurant. And you can respond in kind. So these are all applications of all the stuff. But we're going to see, like, these, you be paid for these, right? And they're out there and they're easy to use. And I recommend production usage. Go for it. Like, you know, we all know how good the Google Speech API and the translate are. It's amazing. It's incredible. And at two cents a minute for the Google Speech translation, and my wife is a journalist. And she, they charge them a dollar a minute to do uh, phone call transcriptions. So a couple guys wrapped the Google Speech API in a layer that uploads to S3 and kind of just puts it in a nice format. They're charging 10 cents a minute, and like 4,000 of her journalist friends were like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen, and they all just jumped on board. And you know, they did that, you could build that in a weekend, and these guys are doing it, and that's great. Uh, and the quality is so amazing. The journalist went from saying, hey, I'll spend a dollar a minute only on important phone calls to 10 cents a minute, just toss it all in there, who cares, right? I don't want to take notes as much, this is great for me. So that's the kind of revolution we're talking. And you can do a lot of this stuff yourself. You don't need to pay these companies to do it. If you want to, that's great, but you, there, there's some benefits of doing it yourself that they can't give you in terms of flexibility. Okay, so we're going to be talking on like, you know, how does this interface with asterisk a little bit? So let's just keep going with the latest and greatest here. We're going to get into the actual real stuff. So we'll start with Spacey. And Spacey is a suite of uh, tools that allow for natural language understanding, natural language processing, right? Well, the way they do that, you know, an interesting thing here, we're going to get into something about word vectors. A word vector is basically the idea that you can represent a word, like the word royalty or princess, Elizabeth, hunting, whatever that, basically uh, by the value of other words. So royalty can kind of be defined as like a king, a queen, you know, king, queen, queens are, have a very high probability of being royalty, right? Because that's, <laughs> that's what they are. Um, but you know, a straight, straight up word man might not be that closely tied to royalty, right? It might be a royalty of a dog or something like that. Uh, princess, same sort of thing. King and queen are not princesses. Princesses are also not really men, but they're all, they, they are almost always women, right? So there's a very high probability there. So actually, these are called, uh, you know, vectors. A vector is a, a, a one n, a one by n um, matrix here. So you can see you have, you know, one uh, row by n number of columns. And that this is what defines, you know, a king is made up of a lot of royalty. A king is not much princess. A king is also probably not named Elizabeth. But kings do go hunting a lot, right? So this is just a probability matrix. And when we get into the matrix algebra of that, how they come together, it's very interesting. So you can actually build up ways to represent words using math, which is what we need, right, in order to compute things. So here are the actual word vectors themselves, right? So we're looking at, if you remember this from anyone who's done linear algebra and vectors, vectors have a direction and some sort of, you know, coordinates. So the coordinates for man are, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.8 for king, and 0 0.3, 0 0.8 for woman. Well, what happens if we want to figure out what is woman minus man plus king? Right? It's like, okay, this is the question you're asking the machine learning algorithm. It doesn't know the answer necessarily. It's like, I've never heard that question before. Well, it's going to take a look. It goes, well, I'm going to create that vector right there. Right? I made this a little bit strange. So that's right there. Right? This vector down here is a backwards vector because what we're doing is saying, this is the vector generated by 0 0.3, 0 0.8, minus 0 0.5, 0 0.4. So we're taking those coordinates, minusing them. That creates a negative vector of minus 0.2 to 0.4, right? So we're looking, we've got a negative direction here. Remember, vectors of directions, so that's important. Negative direction, but a positive height, so minus 0.4. So plus that to king, here's the plusing, right? So we're just going to add that onto the end of king there. And guess what? What does that possibly equal? There. It's the vector for, well, let's get that, the vector for queen, right? So the actual, ma so it turns out that the closest thing in the matrix array would be queen. That's where queen lives. Because it's learned through the probabilities that that's the most likely outcome of trying to do that. Your training data has to be good to get there, but if you have your training stuff labeled properly, this is the kind of math that gets you there, right? It's actually not that complicated, and it kind of makes sense in a certain way. Does that, that sort of make sense? Or is or that, are we cool? All right, I can, I can keep, keep tracking on that, but we'll just keep chugging along. So, you know, it also is interesting that pairs of words, using this, it gets some very subtle implications that get kind of exciting over time. Uh, I encourage people to dig into the math if you're into it. It's, like I said, it's pretty accessible, actually, if you have a little bit of background, or if not, it's not bad to learn. But certain things like, um, you can take, you know, x of trees, the vector for trees, minus one tree, and it understands that's kind of the same thing as the vector for chairs minus one well, chair, not char. Uh, and one, the vector for cities minus city. Like, it understands, based on just the way all the, the matrix algebra works out, that those are 
almost equivalent. Like you're, try, you're asking the same kind of question. Uh, and that becomes very important when you're trying to do natural language understanding of someone's you know, intent or figuring out what they're trying to get to, is we, you look at training examples of things that are vaguely similar and be like, oh, okay, they're probably with a certain confidence asking this kind of question. And it all comes down to confidence and probabilities. Um, so here's a good example, right? Um, Spacey is, again, you can do lots of fun stuff with it. It does sentence tokenization, parser speech tagging, and named entity recognition. These are things that are all kind of built into it. So we pass this into it right here, right? There's a little curl script right here. So a place like Digimon is full of amazing people and Matt Jordan, right? He's, he's not here. That's too bad. I like digging on him, but he's never around. Um, anyway, it pulled out from this, it knows, based on the training data, that Digium is most likely a uh, proper uh, noun of a place or uh, entity, and it pulled out a person, Matt Jordan. It knows that because it's been trained on data that has lots of people and places and proper nouns and things like that. It can pull all of that out. Uh, and it tells you the start and end you know, places right here. And I mean, I can actually, I won't show this right now, I might show it at the end if you want, but I have this running in a container on my laptop, and you just curl that straight in there and it takes it, you know, a couple milliseconds. It can process these incredibly fast. This is also down here a very interesting little, you know, you can type these in here. This is the sort of a UI for Spacey, that Astrocon is the most amazing special place on Earth. It does parts of speech tagging, right? Astrocon it understands a sort of a, you know, a proper noun. Um, I'm actually terrible at like, that diagramming speech. It's like something I just missed in fifth grade. I don't, people are amazing at this and I find it very hard. But Spacey's amazing at it too. Uh, you know, here's a bunch of adverbs. And so you can use these to figure out all sorts of information about your text. Um, why would this be interesting? Uh, maybe you're transcribing voicemails, right? And you want to know, are people talking about something in particular? Uh, or you're transcribing um, calls through a queue or some sort of call center. And you want to know, are they hitting certain keywords? Are these things being said? Uh, should we get alerts if they're not? Because this can all be done in real time, right? Just running somewhere on like a Docker swarm nearby you. Uh, another one, a good one, is Rasa. So Rasa NLU is uh, basically spacey with a bunch of other stuff tacked onto it. Uh, it's another open source project run by these guys. Uh, and here's the training set. So this is like a good example of like kind of a, a training set for an intent structure. So we have right here things that basically mean affirm, like yes, we want these things. So yep, yes, indeed, all right, great, cool. We have goodbye, which is something, you know, somebody says one of these things, bye, okay, you know, stop, later. Again, greets, and then, like I was saying earlier, the restaurant search. This is their demo. You know, show me Mexican cuisine, and like, the, and again, you don't have to say these exact words, right? You're training the model to do this, and I'm actually going to show you this one because it's kind of interesting. Um, I got to just bring up the right. I have a lot of these things open right now. I think this is the right one. Okay, um, let's close that. And I was just doing the right. All right, so this is how you train it. So I've downloaded. Uh, you can't see that, can you? Uh, one sec. How do I, let me just, one sec here. I'm just gonna scooch this down a little bit so you can see what it is. There we go, okay. So, I'm gonna post to this URL the training data. So that training data you saw on the screen like two seconds ago is in this file, demo-rasa. It's just a markdown file. I'm going to po post that to Astrocon model two, because I already trained Astrocon model, and check it out. So that's being sent up there, right? That tiny little file. So it is now doing the training phase of that model. And we'll just wait for a minute. Like, and so it's actually doing. This is the machine learning happening right now in the background. And as you can see, it's not instantaneous, right? Training these, these networks and things takes a little while and quite a bit of compute. Um, this is a 2003 MacBook Pro. It's got no limitations in that container of what kind of resources it can use. So it's using the whole computer right now to kind of churn through that. And it should take it about you know, 30 or 45 seconds. Uh, and then we can post something to it. But the actual returns from it, once it's done training, the output, there we go, all done. The output is very quick. So now if we post something like, you know, this one right here. So I'll post it even to the same model. For sure, dude. Like that was not something we trained it for. That's SoCal speak for this is awesome. Uh, we send that in there and boom, there we go. Check it out. Confidence is only at 0.49 that this is a firm, but it did get it right. It knew that I was, that I was probably positive. Gives you the confidence ratios for a firm, another confidence ratio. The next one down is greeting. It's like, no, it's probably not that. It's only 0.2. Definitely not a good buy. And most certainly we're not trying to do a restaurant search. So, you know, and that, that's as long as it takes. Now you can build up that training data as fast as you want. Uh, let me go back to my little sweep. And then, so you can build that up, this data, 
pretty fast, right? And this is where it starts to get very interesting because if you have your own thing you're looking for for confidence, you know, if you're in the automotive industry or insurance or whatever you're doing that you know, you're looking for very specific terms, you can build this very, very quickly. Uh, the confidence results are very good. The more examples you give it, the better the training set is. Uh, that's not, I forgot it's not working. Okay, so there we go. This is the restaurant search example. I want something delicious. Again, not something that's trained, uh, but it got that I was looking for food. Sentiment analysis. This is another pretty simple fast forward one. Um, these are actual, like, you know, just Docker images you can download right away. This one is trained on uh, the AFIN 165, which is just a whole bunch of words that were rated minus five to plus five in terms of negativity to positivity. And you just throw some data at it. Again, I think the number of operations on this first one is through a, a Node.js sentiment analyzer that I think can do, it said, at least in the docs, it does about 500,000 analyses a second. So, I mean, these things are lightning fast and does a pretty good job, right? Astrocon kind of such an amazing place. It can pull out positive words, amazing. Again, you're looking for basic sentiment analysis here. You can, d again, train it to be as specific as you want. The other one there, I like the emoji sentiment ranking. I had no idea that was even a thing until a while ago. People have ranked emojis in terms of how like, positive or negative different emojis are, um, which I really would, I'm like, I would love to have been that team. Because uh, I got, you know, thumbs up for beers, and that's two positive emojis, so. You know, unless you're, you know, allergic to, unless you're allergic to gluten, I don't know how they, how they value that. That joke is much better in California, by the way. Everyone's allergic to gluten in California. Uh, but yeah, it's cool. So you know, I throw, this was also built for analyzing Twitter feeds, right? All the kids using hashtags and emojis everywhere. You need to get some sentiment out of them. Do they like your product? Do they not like your product? Uh, you know, slap it through this thing. Get a, get a quick, quick, quick feedback on some sort of emotional state of your audience. Speech rec. Now we're getting to the stuff that's more fun for us, right? The stuff that we do is things we pump out all the time. Uh, this field is changing incredibly quickly. All three projects I'm about to talk about uh, were papers released this year, uh, as recently as May. And so these things are changing almost month by month, and they're getting better and better. Deep speech, whoops. Deep speech, <laughs> don't want to scare you in the next one. Uh, deep speech is an implementation by do release the paper uh, based on you know, neural net and backpropagated networks and recombinant neural networks of how to do speech analysis. This is uh, ASR, right? We're doing ASR here. Uh, somebody then used that to, to build TensorFlow underneath it to actually do the neural networking. And deep speech is the result. It's an open source Mozilla project. Um, and uh, just a quick thing on neural nets, if you've never seen these before, this is sort of how they work, right? It's not, again, it's not incredibly complicated. Uh, you have an input layer where you sort of stick in, you know, in this case, it's usually, it, it would be like spectrographic data or chunkified like, you know, little milliseconds of audio. You stick it in the input layer. That then propagates a bunch of hidden layers. And all those hidden layers really are, are different weighted sets of maths. And it, as the data flows through that, it does some transformations on it, comes to the output layer, and then gets to the cost function. The cost function is what decides you know, what, when you're training it, was this right or not? You know when you're training it, I'm gonna jam in the front side of this thing, the words, Astrocon is awesome, and the far side, I know that's what I want, and if they're not equivalent, your cost function should be something that calculates basically the error on that. Using that error, that's the back propagation. You say, that was really wrong. If it comes out with like, that's not very close to Astrocon is awesome, uh, but maybe it's closer than, so it actually can tell based on the spectrographic data that those two are you know, very dissimilar. Back propagates that through the, the network, updates the weights, and tries again. Now, you might say, like, well, that sounds pretty, like it takes a long time, because you're constantly retrying everything. Yeah, it takes a really long time, which is why you throw it into GPUs and let them sit there for three days. And it takes like 40 gigabytes of actual audio files to make like, deep speech work. If you look at the examples online, Google slammed, just they have unlimited resources and unlimited examples of this from the voicemails everyone leaves on Google Voice, so they have all kinds of amazing stuff to throw into it. Um, they're using a basic thing. This is actually, just to catch you up real fast, gradient descent, this is what they used to do, like, kind of functions. Basically, all you're trying to do is minimize the error, right? We're trying to minimize error in all these functions. And here's a couple of just like real quick examples. Um, the very beginning of it, the math of it, again, uses partial differential equations to calculate tangents to slopes. And it's very interesting math if you want to get into it. But you basically just have to calculate the slope down there. And all you're trying to do is slowly walk downhill. You just want to walk, walk, walk until you get to the bottom of the trough here. Bottom of the trough is the minimum error function you're possibly going to get. Uh, you always have you know, cases where you might have local minima. Like over there, you saw that, that it started somewhere on that hill. It's trying to get down to the bottom. And it hit down here first, maybe. Like you started right on this right here. You go boop, 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 boop. And you get to this little local minima right here. Well, your cost function might say it looks around itself. Yeah. Is that a human, say, 
good, bad, or? No, it's the actual, you, there's an algorithm that, def that calculates the error rate, like the error at the end of the output. So during the training phase, you will have uh, your inputs come in and your output, and your output is re-verified against your input. That's where the training part comes in, right? So you know if your input is the phrase, Astrocon is awesome, and your output doesn't look like that mathematically at all, you know your error rate's pretty high. So it'll, it'll backpropagate that, that, like change some of the learning rates, the different steps, and the perceptrons, and the hidden layers, and then try it again. And if it gets a little bit closer, the error rate narrows a little tiny bit, and then you notice, oh, I'm a little bit closer to the actual input phrase of Astrocon is awesome. Right? And you just keep iterating that, iterating that, iterating that, until at some point you're iterating it and it's not getting any better. The error rate stays the same. That's when you've reached the local minima down here. Right? And uh, same thing over here. Now the problem is right, you, might reach, you might reach a minima somewhere where it thinks it's got, oh great, I'm here, I'm done, I, I can't get any better. And it turns out you actually missed the big one over here. Right? You missed the major one. So there are other mathematical ways they can do to calculate like, like larger steps, larger learning rates. If you start playing with this, you hear the word learning rate a lot. Adjusting the learning rate up and down is how big these steps downhill are. Take little tiny baby steps, you're most likely going to get to the local minima a lot faster. Like you're going doot, 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 doot. If you take big training steps, you can get down there a lot faster but you can also overshoot it and end up over here and start wobbling back and forth and actually eventually like work your way back out. So varying training rates, this is why it's a little bit of an art and a little bit of a science because you run these for a couple of days, you're like, oh, it looks pretty good. What if you tweaked like four things? It could be 10 times better. You don't really know. And looking at all different weights in the neural net is just uh, like just kind of functionally hard. Uh, to understand what it's done when it's done is just a lot of different weights and the way the math all works out is just very, very complex, particularly when a lot of these things are like 256 layers on 256 layers on 1,000 layers. Suddenly it gets to the point where humans can't actually look at it. So you just have to understand what's going on and keep trying different ways. Anyway, the best available that I saw on this, this GitHub repo, somebody was getting about a 13% error rate, training it on a bunch of different corpora training models, uh, which is pretty good for you know an open source project that's just doing pie in the sky, you know ASR on whatever you want. 13% is pretty darn good. Uh, and that's pretty exciting that that's coming out. Mozilla's actually got this thing right now. One of the biggest limitations at the moment is that there's not enough voice, quality voice training data. And we can't just chain Alice into a, you know, a room and just make her speak for four months straight. So what they want is everyone to record their own voices. They also, want, they also want multiple voices, multiple speakers to figure out how differences in you know, phrases and sayings are done. Um, and accents, things like that. So go to voice.mozilla.org. You can volunteer to like say a phrase or say 20 minutes uh, and help push this forward if you have time. And they're going to release it all open source. So in quarter four, we're going to have about 10,000 hours recorded to do training on, uh, which will be pretty exciting. Because um, it's also useful in the next thing, which is speech synthesis. So one of the other things Google came out with uh, was this uh, thing called WaveNet. And WaveNet is basically the idea of, again, a neural net is learning things, right? You got your inputs down here. You're going through the hidden layers to the output. But it's doing, this is trying to now do TTS. So we're now, we're now we're trying to go back from the text to the speech. And how do we do that, right? Things sound weird. Uh, you know, he read a book versus she reads a book, right? Read and read, pronounced very differently, look very similarly in text. Uh, and so you've got to figure out how to make all of that work. Historically, there were a couple different ways. Uh, concatenative and parametric TTS. Those are the things we like here on our Mac and that kind of stuff. Um, let me see. I actually have... Hold on. This is. I didn't know how Keynote would run those. I'm going to run those through here. Okay. So the concatenative one sounds like this, right? This is sort of an old school one we've all heard before. I don't know. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Okay. The Blue Lagoon, you know, that sounds, that sounds okay, kind of what we heard before. Here's a parametric version. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. I can tell it's maybe slightly better. The speaker down here is pretty bad, but it sounds a little bit better. And now here's the WaveNet version. See if you can tell there's a difference. Well, it didn't sound that different through that speaker, but rest assured, uh, I'll put these up online. You can go check them all out if you Google this. They actually sound quite a bit different. And the WaveNet one sounds much more realistic, like almost almost real human. There's a little level of background noise, which is really fascinating. It picked up on the fact that like people don't like silences, so it actually has incorporated background noise into a lot of the examples. Um, which is like, you know, just these funky little things you wouldn't really expect. There's some great examples of this online, so I do recommend looking at it later. Uh, it's also great for music. This is a really cool thing too, right? WaveNet turns out that it's very difficult and you need a lot of data to get the WaveNet to run for human speech. It might not be the best, it takes forever to train. But you know what's really great at is generating music. Uh, they trained it on 60 hours of piano and it came up with stuff like this.
right? Sounds like a little bit of jazz, right? That, that was all generated artificially by the neural net. So the idea that it can actually generate, let's say, music on hold, right? You could have your own kind of music on hold. You train it on the kind of music you like. Maybe that's a unique thing you can have in there. Uh, I don't necessarily, it might be a little overkill, but it's certainly something that would be kind of fascinating to work on. So, yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. Okay, great. Uh, and the last one I'm going to talk about right now is this one called Tacotron. And I love that these guys just come with these names. It's just fantastic. Um, so Tacotron, so WaveNet was probably the first one to come through. Uh, so Deep Speech was the first one from Baidu. Building onto Deep Speech was WaveNet. And Tacotron is uh, like the third generation. And now they're doing things like Tacotron with WaveNet. And they're just slamming them all together and seeing what happens. And Tacotron basically just does, uses text audio pairs. So you have a piece of text, somebody saying the, t, you know, two waves. And it pairs up with the audio of waves and uses that to train it directly from voice. So it, there are different ways of training, right? You're going through um, phonemes, things like that. This just goes straight from audio and uh, text pairs all the way up again. Uh, and it's very fast. The problem with WaveNet is very slow. This is very fast. This is actually approaching real time to the point where you put this as your back end, you're getting real time synthesized voice uh, for TTS. In any, you know, with, with any accent, any dialect, different speakers, whatever you want. Um, we're all, it's almost there. I think right now it can generate about six seconds in about Five seconds. It's just it's a little. It's like right on the edge of being really super duper usable. Um, I'm going to back off this too because it has more audio examples. So the complexity one here is here's an example of this is not anything that was ever trained how to say. This is just you know a random sentence was put together. Hold on. These are too good to have it be that bad. Uh, I think this is like yeah here. Uh, so th right after this, I was going to go into an intro into partial differential equations, and I was just kidding about that, and then I was going to take questions. So let me back out here and actually, I'm going to unplug the HDMI so I can play this through my speaker so you actually hear the difference a little bit better. So let's see if I can capture this a little bit more on my laptop so it actually sounds better. So here's the complexity example. Basilar membrane and otolaryngology are not autocorrelations. Right? Pretty good. That was not something that was trained to do. Here's some stresses. This is one maybe I, I should put back up there. This is, the, this is the sentence, the buses aren't the problem, they actually provide a solution. Versus capitalizing the word problem and capitalizing the word solution. It says the buses aren't the problem, you know, they actually provide a solution. You know, it's like, that makes sense to us, but you see that written down, and you're like, oh, you know, how would it know that? Well, it's been trained to know that. So here's the first one. The buses aren't the problem, they actually provide a solution. And here is the second one. The buses aren't the problem. They actually provide a solution. Right? Sounds pretty natural for a computer-generated voice. I'm going to back up to the previous examples as well real quick, just to give you the quick concatenate of one. And then uh, if anybody has any questions, let me just find that slide. Here we go. All right, so here's the concatenate of one again. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleist. Great. Parametric? The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. All right, kind of sounds like we like to. And here's the wave net. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. I think it sounds a lot more natural. And the most scores on those improve. I think the, the concatenative one was about 3 point made something, and the uh, wave net came out to about a 4.2. So about a 50% jump in actual clarity of speech. Um, Anyway, uh, that's, the, that's the state of the art right now. That's what's happening. It's changing fast. I recommend people kind of Googling these things and looking into them. Um, you can deploy a lot of them. Um, I'll just plug this back in for a sec if you want to see if this actually works. But I have a lot of those examples running, like I was showing, in my terminal here. And you can just like throw things at them. So let's like, you know, we can throw at, uh, here's the Matt Jordan one I was showing before. There we go. Throws out the Digium. You know, these are all just running in Docker containers. You can play with them today and tomorrow. If you have any questions, let me know, and I will post these. There's the emoji one, right? So, yeah, exciting stuff. So where did you say to get a background in the math and better understand this? If you want to right now? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a great line, the great, uh, if you go to Coursera, if you watch Andrew Ng's intro into machine learning, he covers, a he covers it without knowing the no linear algebra differential equations, but he stops at important points and says, hey, if, if you know how to do a partial differential equation, this makes a lot of sense. If you don't, go Google that. And like you Google partial differential equations, how to solve them. And it actually is very, it gets intuitive. So like, he'll pause allow you to go do that and come back again. And they have a review of linear algebra. The matrix algebra is actually very simple once you get used to it. Uh, and then you just need to, if you've done it before, just refresh yourself. 
Any other questions? Yeah. I've read a lot about uh, predictive text and machine learning as it re as it relates to um, creating new uh, fic fictive prose. Sure. So creating new fiction. So sure. for, for there was the example a couple years back where um, these guys fed, I think, 50 B-movie sci-fi scripts into this predictive text, and it spat out a movie, which they filmed a year ago, <laughs> I think. Um, it's still in post-production. Um, is this where that genesis sort of comes from? Is there a way, using, say, the Spacey tools or the other tools you're showing us, mm -hmm. uh, to make that kind of, I'm feeding you a bunch of text... And then you will read it, and based on the association of the parts of speech, the way they fit together, the relevance of words, the uh, the amount of time certain things tend to show up, mm -hmm. could that work in the same sense? Absolutely. I mean, this is exactly what this is built to do. They are there to take that training data, which in this case was a ton of B-movies, and break down similarities and structure, you know, content. You would need to create probably the algorithm yourself. That sounds like a very specific example of what they're trying to do. Chatbots, like Spacey is great at chatbot creation and chat generation. Um, you can ask it questions because you can train it very quickly. Um, but yeah, it pretty much just figures out all the relationships between words. It might even figure out the relationships between characters like you have you know again it might understand that you know when Richard and Susie are in a room together generally like you know Doug shows up or whatever or somebody it might understand what a deus ex machina is and just like suddenly there's like you know something just happens because it knows that creates heightened tension you have to tell it here in the script this is heightened tension right you got to label all that stuff and spend time doing that and that's why the training data is actually the most important part of this and you get that good training data get it nicely organized and you know, fed in there and the better the training data the better the output Do they? Cool. Yeah, I mean that's and that's the kind of stuff where uh, that wouldn't surprise me at all. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking about say uh, the Rasa NLU and you were giving intents, uh, does Rasa NLU already have some concept of the English language? Because uh, you know, how does it know uh, that this English word that it hasn't seen in your training data is related without? Of yes, it's got built into that because Rasa is its own like it's a combination of um, Spacey, uh, I think Scikit-Learn, and a bunch of other libraries and tools. So it know I think it has an English language component to it. I think it does English, Spanish, and German at the moment are the three languages it knows. So it knows relationships between words in those languages because it's been set up with I think vector diagrams of those. Um, they're looking for pulls to do more languages as well. Yeah, so that's why it's a great tool, right? Someone's gone through the set the 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 trouble of setting all that up for us so we can just start plugging in intents right away. And it was built to replace things like wit.ai, lewis.ai. Uh, it was just specifically done. They were like, we don't want to pay for that. We want to run it ourselves and customize these to our business purposes. Yeah, so hook that into your IVR and then generate Allison's voice and she's out of a job. I told her I wouldn't say that. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions? Great. Well, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for coming. Have a great day.